received the letters which are inserted in the preface. Sixth, interrogated by Sir Hudson Lowe, whether Napoleon Bonaparte had directed or commanded me to make a communication which I had done to him, these that he, Napoleon, had sold Lord Amherst. Neither of your houses of parliament can oblige me to see my executioner, or whether I had repeated it without having had authority to do so from Bonaparte. I answered that Napoleon had said, if I were asked any questions about the conversation with him, I was permitted to mention it. This did not satisfy Sir Hudson Lowe, who wished me to answer it as best suited whatever purpose he had in view. And on my persisting in the above reply, he became very violent and abusive and ordered Major Goraker to write down, Mr. O'Meara refuses to reply to the question of, did Bonaparte or did he not desire you to communicate the above mentioned expressions to the governor? I said that some persons would consider it as a desire and others only as a permission, and therefore it was best to put down Napoleon's words, which, however, His Excellency would not allow. Seventh, Sir Hudson Lowe sent for me at six o'clock in the evening, when after having made some inquiries about Napoleon's state of health, which I told him was not so good as the last time I had reported, he said that if General Bonaparte, thought he should gain any further relaxation in the restrictions by confining himself to the house in the manner he did. He was mistaken as he, Sir Hudson, without an order from government, would not make any more alterations in the regulations, even if he were worse in health. I asked if he wished this to be communicated to Napoleon. He said that he did not desire it, but that it ought to be known. Ninth another series of interrogations at Plantation House, partly about Lord Amherst, during which the governor said that General Bonaparte would not have dared to make use of the insulting expression he did before any other persons than Lord Amherst and myself. That General Bonaparte had so expressed himself because he, Napoleon, knew that his lordship had received the governor's permission to listen to any complaints which he might make that a listener was as bad as a repeater, and that Count Bertrand had told him, Sir Hudson, in October last, that General Bonaparte was influenced by the persons about him, amongst whom I formed one. I could scarcely help smiling at the supposition that I could have influenced such a person as Napoleon, and contented myself with replying that, as far as I knew him, he was not a man to let himself be guided by the opinion of others. Sir Hudson, however, insisted that Count Bertrand had confessed it and said that I should be responsible for a great deal of what might happen. The 13th. More interrogations at Plantation House. Sir Hudson Lowe took out of his pocket a morning chronicle of the 17th of September, 1817, I think, containing a detail of a conversation stated to have taken place between Napoleon and some English gentleman, and was desirous, he said, to know from me whether such a conversation had ever taken place between General Bonaparte and myself or if I had ever communicated it to other persons, that he inferred from the commencement of the article, viz., after the usual salutations, that the conversation had taken place between General Bonaparte and some person who was frequently in the habit of seeing him, that Admiral Malcolm and myself were the only persons who had tete-a-tete -tete conversations with him. Therefore, it must have been communicated by one of us, I replied that I had neither written nor communicated it and reminded him that others besides the Admiral and myself had communications with Napoleon. His Excellency appeared to be very anxious that I should assist him to saddle it upon the Admiral, in which, however, he did not succeed. Indeed, on the first glance I had of it, I saw that it must have come from Mr. Ellis. It, however, contained some misrepresentations. 15th, saw the governor at Plantation House, to whom I reported that Napoleon's indisposition had rather increased, and that I had been that morning under the necessity of giving him a physic. Communicated the same to Mr. Baxter. 16th, saw Napoleon, who felt somewhat relieved by the effect of the physic administered yesterday, had a conversation with him upon some other early periods of his life, and the manner in which he had obtain the command of the troops of the convention against the sections. 
When Minu said he was repulsed in his attempt to disperse the sections through the imbecility of the representatives who were with them and his own incapacity, the convention was in the greatest alarm. As the comité of the section had declared itself sovereign in the exercise of its functions and permanent refusing to obey the orders of the convention and had even sent deputations to the other sections to assist them. Their number amounted to above 40,000. I was in the box at the theater, fade out. When informed of this and proceeded to the assembly, the convention were in the greatest dismay. Menu was accused of treachery. The danger was imminent. Each member of the assembly proposed the general in whom he had confidence, the members of the Committee of Public Safety, and some who had known me at Toulon proposed me as a person best calculated by the energy of my character to save them in the present crisis. A deputation was sent to offer the command to me. I balanced, however, for some time before I would accept of it. It was a service I did not like, but... When I considered that if the convention was overturned, the foreigner would triumph, that the destruction of that body would seal the slavery of the country and bring back an incapable and insolent race whose reflections and destiny decided that I should accept of it. I went to the comité, pointed out to them the inconvenience of having three representatives with the troops who only served to impede all the opposite operations of the general. The committee, were perceiving that there was no time to be lost, proposed Barra to the convention as general-in-chief and gave the command of the truce so were to protect the assembly to me. The measures that I adopted, as I explained to you before, saved the convention with very trifling loss of men on both sides. 20th. Went to Plantation House, according to orders, while I was speaking to Mr. Baxter in the library. The governor came in, looking very angry, and asked in a rough and abrupt manner what communications I had to make respecting General Bonaparte's health. I replied that no permanent relief for the better had taken place. Has he been out of the house? He has not. Has he been in the billiard room? He spends a considerable portion of his time there every day. How does he employ his time there? I cannot tell, sir. Yes, you can, sir, replied the governor, regarding me in his customary manner. You know well what he does there. You do not do your duty to government. His excellency then walked about the room, stopping occasionally and regarding me with his arms crossed over his breast in a manner which it is difficult to describe, and bursting out in furious exclamations. I contented myself with taking out my watch to ascertain the length of time he contemplated me in this manner. I thought more than once that he meditated some act of violence. This composure and silence appeared not to be what he wished. And he began another series of interrogations in his usual manner relative to the name of the person who had given me information about 12 months ago that Lord Liverpool had interfered and prevented my removal from St. Helena. I answered that I had. At the time, I had first mentioned it to him in July last, offered to show to a third person that part of the letter which stated the application had been made to Lord Liverpool that his lordship should prevent my being removed. The governor renewed in a violent tone his demand that I should forthwith give him the names of the persons who had communicated the information to me and that the offer I had then made of showing it to a third person was an insult to him and advanced towards me in a menacing manner, evidently with an intention to intimidate me into compliance. I answered as before, which drew forth another demand of the name with an increase of violence. I said then that as my replies only brought upon me abuse, bad language, and bad treatment, I must decline giving him any more answers on the subject. Put down, Major Corker. That Mr. O'Meara refused to answer, was the governor's reply. After listening to a long and abusive harangue about my improper conduct since he had catechized me about a newspaper, I was permitted to part.